Verbal communication firstly starts when a speaker has an idea. You can see here the person on the left has an idea and they need to get the information across to the person on the right. So how does this happen? The speaker on the left needs to decide how to get the message across to the speaker on the right. This includes deciding what kind of language they will use. We call this particular part of our communication process encoding. Once the information is encoded, the message needs to be transmitted. So the speaker on the left says or demonstrates what they encoded. Once the message is transmitted, the listener on the right then interprets the words, body language, facial expressions, voice and so on that make up the message. This interpretation is known as decoding. The listener understands what has been decoded in a certain way and may then provide feedback to the speaker about what has been heard. So to summarize, the speaker on the left has an idea that gets encoded. Then the encoded message is transmitted and received by the listener. The message is then decoded. This whole process is influenced by cultural background, physical and mental health, and a listener's previous experiences with the person who is communicating the message. Only 20% of communication is expressed via spoken words. Let's discuss the nonverbal component of communication. How we use our bodies plays a big role in communicating our attitudes and feelings. Research tells us that 80% of communication occurs through nonverbal means. This includes gestures and facial expressions, body posture, stance, and proximity to the listener, eye movements and contact, and dress and appearance. Nonverbal behaviors may not always be read in the same way due to cultural or other reasons. For example, an Indigenous student may not use as much eye contact as eye contact can be seen as a sign of disrespect. Another example of this is when a student has a disability in the autism spectrum, they will often find eye contact difficult. Listening is the mentor's greatest tool for developing relationships. Being listened to makes someone feel valued, important and respected. Often students don't truly feel listened to. So this is one of the greatest gifts a mentor can give. And active listeners suspend judgment and criticism, don't interrupt, respect the speaker's point of view and value system, resist distractions, let the speaker know if they cannot be heard, they are open and deal with any negative emotions that they might be hearing. So when communicating with mentees, clear your mind of unnecessary thoughts and distractions. Make culturally appropriate eye contact. Check your body language. Pay attention to the mentee's facial expressions, gestures and body language. And read between the lines for implicit feelings. Ask open-ended questions that provoke conversation. Paraphrasing is a fantastic tool, so go over what you think that they've just said. Clarify what you don't understand. Put yourself in the mentee's place and get their perspective. Put aside any preconceived ideas and pass no judgments. Nod your head and say things like, I see. Mentors sometimes wonder, if they're listening and responding effectively. If a mentee talks with their mentor about personal issues, shares their joys and woes, and occasionally their feelings, a mentor will know that they are being understanding and helpful. And in some cases, the cues are subtler. Just as there is effective listening, there is also ineffective listening. So let's talk about what sorts of things stop us from being effective listeners. There are many causes of ineffective listening, and this can include environmental limits, such as places that are noisy, cold, badly lit, 
poorly ventilated or badly arranged and have constant distractions like mobile phones. Language or cultural limits can include multiple or ambiguous meanings of words, poor command of vocabulary due to age, education, jargon, slang, dialect, or English being a second language. Being critical or making moral judgments puts the other person on guard and usually reduces their willingness to share and be honest. Shouldering is a term that is when you tell the other person what they should do. And it comes off as extremely judgmental behavior and it's guaranteed to create distance. Put downs and patronizing statements ridicule or shame the other person. They are likely to be countered by aggression at one extreme and withdrawal at the other. Interruption shows an unwillingness to listen, being more concerned with dominating or impressing the other person than achieving understanding. Using cliches, using those tired and worn out phrases like better late than never results in little value or significance to the person's issues. Asking pseudo questions. So these are questions that attempt to manipulate, influence or control, such as, would you agree that? Rather than questions that elicit information or opinion, such as asking open-ended questions, instead of saying, would you agree that? You could say, what are your thoughts on? Shifting is about moving focus away and diverting the discussion to avoid dealing with anything uncomfortable. If something is uncomfortable and exceeds mentoring boundaries, shifting is a great technique. However, when discussing a particular topic or advice, shifting is not advised. Small talk is something that you will engage in a lot as a mentor when you meet new people. So what is it? Small talk is light, casual conversation used commonly when you are speaking with someone you don't know well. So why is it going to be important in the role of a mentor? Small talk really establishes common ground and makes people feel more comfortable creating the basis of a relationship. When using small talk, it is useful to incorporate questions that include who, what, when, where, why, and how, because these allow for open-ended questions and a conversation with greater depth. It is useful to find something in common or discuss simple topics like uni, jobs, family background and hobbies. Try to stay away from controversial topics like politics. Compliments work well too, but make sure after you compliment someone, you follow the conversation with an open-ended question. For example, that's such a nice top, where did you get it? Sometimes others do not know how to take compliments, so make sure you follow up with a question afterwards. Using the person's name in small talk will also help you develop and build rapport with your mentees, as people appreciate the special attention. As a mentor, you will be both a coach and a facilitator. Coaching is when you direct an individual to come to a conclusion. As a mentor, you coach mentees when you instruct and provide the answers, direct opinions or facts. Facilitating is guiding someone to make their own conclusion. Facilitation involves dealing with a process. So as a mentor, you also facilitate discussions. This means focusing on how groups participate. If you have a shy group member, engage them in conversation by saying, Sarah, what do you think about what Jim said? When you're a facilitator, you remain neutral. So what are some tips for facilitating groups? Keep conversation moving and focused. I'm sure we've all experienced a conversation which has gone off on a tangent Ask open-ended questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Be aware of your body language. Validate all responses of your group members. Tell them they've done a great job or have an interesting idea. Obtain the authority to lead. Although you remain neutral, you must make sure you lead the conversation. 
Prompt group members to speak. If you notice, not all members are participating. I'm sure we've all experienced going into a classroom and the tutor says, okay, we're going to do an activity to get to know one another. These activities are called icebreakers and they're really effective to help people get to know one another. Some common icebreakers include speed friendship, two truths and one lie, the human knot and celebrity heads. Our iLearn page iMentor has a detailed list of icebreakers, so make sure that you're familiar with these. And when we play icebreakers, it's important to involve all of your group. Before playing an icebreaker, there are a number of considerations we must think about. And these include gender, age, ethnicity, religion, size, language ability, disabilities, location, and noise levels.